Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about this. This is the smart cut, which you can get if you want to use the washing machine in the washing machine room. So you have lots. To, uh, I'm in a building where there are around six washing machines, and to to pay them, you just get one of these cards, you put money on the chip inside, then you insert it into the machine and then you can pay your washing machine with that. And I wanted to, to figure out how how this works. This is the washing room. As you can see we have two, five, six washing machines on the left and then we have four dryers on the right. And each of them have a um, card reading uh, machine on the top. So normally how it works, you put your laundry in the machine, you close the door, that's a hard door, you set the mode and then with your cards you go in the automat in the beginning, you insert it, it will display the value on the card and then you press OK to start the machine and then you can start on the start button. This is how it normally works. To find out why type of card this is, I will use a smart card reader. This is the OmniKey Cardman 5321. Um, I think it's a pretty good smart card reader and I use it quite, quite often. And I'll, on, then on the computer I will use a utility called PCSC Scan. This is part of the PCSC Utils package. And what it allows you is just read the card, wait for a card which is inserted and give information about it. Here I will use my old credit card which is expired since long and if I put it inside you see that in the beginning it waits for this ATR, the answer to reset. This is sent by the cards whenever it's powered on and it gives you some information about the card itself. And here it's even identified as from the Royal Bank of Scotland, which obviously this credit card was for. Now if I put this card inside, it will tell me that the card is inserted, but it's unresponsive. So whenever the smart card is inserted and powered on, it will not send the answer to reset, which we've seen in the beginning. And this system of sending the answer to reset is defined in the standard for smart cards ISO 7816. I think part, part 2 or part 3, probably part 3, yeah part 3. And this card doesn't follow this standard. Um, so I don't know what it runs on. But this tool comes also with a Windows utility. So on my Windows VM I will use the tool called OmniKey Workbench which is provided by OmniKey for, for this reader. And if I connect the reader to it, let's connect the reader to the smart card, the smart card reader. Here we see that there's the smart card reader with all the information and here's something on the box. And again, if I plug in my credit card, you will see that it talks to T equals zero protocol. That's one of the ISO standards uh, the, the, the protocol technologies from the standard I've mentioned. And here is the answer to reset again. And if I put the washing machine card, the wash machine card, you will see it detects it at an I2C smart card, uh, I2C card, it's not really that smart, uh, as an I2C card. Don't, don't believe this ATR because the card did not send any answer to reset. This is a bit confusing. They just display it. That's a fake ATR which just just display to help the user probably. And then he it tells you that it talks the I2C protocol and this is the important part which we wanted to figure out. So this card is not an ISO 7816 smart card, it's a card which talks I2C. And previously, before that, I didn't work on I2C and that was my uh, my initiation for working with, with I2C, particularly this card. And we'll talk about the protocol. So I2C, mm. inter integrated circuit, is a protocol to communicate between um, ICs actually. 
it's been defined by Philips, now called NXP, and this is the standard to it, the UM1024. And you can find all the information you need about the I2C protocol in there. And this is the logo for it. If we go down, I will just show you the most important aspects of this protocol and give you an overview. So for, for this protocol, you need two connections. Well, you need ground and two connection. Here we have SCL. This is the clock line where you can synchronize all the all the device on. And then we have SDC. This is SDA. This is the data line. What's useful with this protocol is that you can have one master and then a lot of other devices, slaves, which are connected also on the bus and they share the bus. The master will initiate the transactions. Um, it will drive the clock. It will initiate a transaction on the data line and then the, all the devices listen to it. And the microcontroller first sends an address and after it sends an address, there is only one of them which is selected and which will respond. Then the microcontroller will, um, the master, which here is the microcontroller, will um, ask, will make some queries and the, only the selected device, here the, for example, LCD driver, will respond to it. So this is a master slave with multiple slave and one master. This is the most used configuration for this. And they all share just these two lines, the clock line and the data line. Um, to connect it, you have the, these two lines and you have to pull it, pull it up uh, using pull up resistors, which we have here. You only have to do it for, for these two lines. And whenever there is no activity at all, then the lines are high. And this is how you detect it, that there's no activity and that you can start calling. There might be multiple masters, for example, um, but here we won't talk about it. But as long as the two lines are open, uh, 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 high, there shouldn't be any kind of communication. Now this is how the how you send the data. Every time you want to send a bit, you send it while the clock, so you pull the clock low, the master will pull the clock low. And in this period, you can change the data when the clock is low. And when the clock is high again, then the data has to be stable, either low or high. So either you pull the data line down or you don't put on the data line and you leave it at a high level. And the data is stable uh, during this, this high clock. So in the middle of the clock, you can read the data. And actually, even at the rising edge, you can read the data because the data should only change uh, on the low side. Then to start talking, um, there is an exception to this rule is that the clock is high, but the data goes low. And by uh, using this trick, the master will send the start condition. And the start condition will tell, okay, now I want to talk. And for example, if the data line is still high, although the... Um, the master try to pull it low, it means there's something else on the device which keeps it high and there, there, there is an error somewhere. And afterwards, the master will stand, uh, will um, set the clock low, set the clock high, make the communication as we explained it just before. So whenever the clock is low, it can change the data. Whenever the clock is high, the data should be stable and so on. Until the end where we see the mechanism again, the date the clock is high, and still the data changes. Now it's on a rising edge. And this rising edge stands for stop bit, mean the communication, it, it, this is the end of the transaction and the, the, two, the two lines are floating again, or not floating, but pulled up again. And this is a whole transaction. So you start with a start condition, you stop with a stop condition, depending on the, the edge. And this is, uh, again, one of the examples where you send a start, S, S, O, S, R, where the clock is high, and then you make the whole transaction. And an additional information here is that the master 
for example, sends 8 bits and that waits for an acknowledgement and the acknowledgement is sent by the, by the device. This is one case. Um, if something is, goes wrong, then someone can pull the clock low and keep it low. So the master pulls the clock low whenever it wants to change data and will let it go high again whenever it's finished. Now, if one of the devices continues pulling it low, it means that I'm not finished or I have some kind of, of, of problem because only the, the master should drive the clock. And by pulling low, the, the device can tell the master, okay, now there's kind of, there's some kind of a problem. That's one of the uh, mechanisms which, which I used. Then we have more about how to handle these errors, how to stretch clocks and so on. But this is not too important to go into details. We only want to figure out uh, how the communication works in an ideal case. And, and then ideal case, this is for, um, for transmitting data. You have the start bit. Then the master will, th will send seven bits to this is the address. And it will, this way it will select which slave devices it wants to communicate to by, by sending this address. And then it will tell, okay, now I want to read or I want to write. If it's high, it's reading. If it's low, it's writing. The device, the slave, which has this address has to respond in this acknowledgement. And if it, um, if it keeps it low, it won't be acknowledged. And if it's high, it will be acknowledged or the other way around. I don't remember exactly. And once this selection is done, so this is the first part. Once this selection is done, then you can continue sending eight bits and this has to be acknowledged. So this acknowledgement is sent by the device. If you re uh, write eight bits and it's sent by, and it's set by the master, if he wants to read even more bits. And you can have lots of data blocks, one of the larger, as many as you want, and you can stop with the stop condition. Here, exactly. Here we have this two kind of communication. Here the master transmits some data. So it starts with the start bit, it selects the address of the slave, then it writes a zero on the eighth bit, because this is seven bit, so it writes a zero on the eighth bit here. And this will tell, okay, now I want to write. And the device has to acknowledge this command. Once this is acknowledged, so when the data line is low, and it can start transmitting. So it will send, it will send eight bits, one byte. And the, the, the slave will again acknowledge this by pulling SDA low and so on and so on until until it is not acknowledged or until the, um, the master sends this stop bit. If you want to read some information, the procedure is the same in the beginning. You start with the start bit, you have seven bits of address, one bit high, now it's a one for reading, the device acknowledges, but this time um, the device sends the data. So the slave sends the data and the master will acknowledge the data. As then the, the slave will continue sending data. And as long as the master acknowledges this data, the slave will continue sending data. Once the master stops acknowledging the data, it will stop sending data and the master can send this stop bit in the end. That's all you need to to implement this protocol almost. The data, the, um, the specification is a bit longer, but this is really the most important information you need to know to implement the I squared C standard. Now that I know which protocol is used by this card, uh, I want to be able to listen to the communication between the card and the washing machine to figure out what is happening. And for that, I have to tap on these points. Generally, on a, on a smart card, the points are quite defined. 
This is ground and you can also see it because it has the biggest plane. Here you see that the middle is also connected to ground and also these two points. So again this is this is the same, this is ground. And in the uh, ISO 7816 standard, part 1 which defines the specific property and part 2 which defines the context, the physical interface, this is VCC, so you provide power here. Then we have two other very important signal which is the clock. This is where the clock pin is and this is where the data pin is. In uh, smart cards it's called I.O. but because we are using I2C this is SDA and this is very probably SCK, the clock and the data line. The two other pins here are not important for I2C, they are more important for uh, smart cards. And to listen to the communication of this card, I have to put it inside and I still want to have access to, to these points, so this is quite hard. This is why I came with this device. This is some kind of a smart card proxy, which I made, which I made of 0.8 millimeter uh, one-sided PCB. 0.8 millimeter is almost the same thickness as a credit card thickness. And here we have the pads of the credit card again, which are routed to, to the end, which are routed to this ID1 slot. ID1 is the form factor for, for these credit cards, I think. So I can still put my card inside. The contact is still there, here and here. And this is forwarded um, to the normal card interface. But in the middle, I have pins, additional pins, which I can tap on. So I can listen on the lines which are used by the credit cards, which are going from the card to the, um, to the pins here. And because this is I to C, you can either use a logic analyzer or I used this board. This is a bus parrot from Dangerous Prototype. It still it speaks multiple protocols and it also offers an I2C sniffer mode. And this way I can very easily sniff the I2C traffic which is happening between the card, which I have in my proxy, and the, the machine which where I will plug this proxy in. Um, let's try that out. And then to find out how it, the machine works, we will use the sniffer. So we'll put the card in the proxy, which will just forward the, the contacts. And on the pins, we just monitor the communication with the bus pirate. And here we have the bus pirate into I2C sniffing mode. And when we will insert it, we will see the traffic. So we just close this damn door and then we insert the card and here you can see already some traffic and the, the value which is here so we know that this corresponds to this value you do it multiple times to see if it differs all the time and at one point you will just read the value trace the traffic from the value and you do that for all the other machines to find out um, if they use the same protocol. So this is the traces which I made using the bus pirates by and my proxy card when I plugged in my card to into the washing machines. So my card had zero euros on it or zero points, and this is what you see on the three traces. I first plugged it in the machine number two. I've replugged in the machine number two to see if there's any difference, and in the end I plugged it in another machine, the machine number four. Now, this is how Best Pirate represents the communication. The open bracket means there is a start condition. Then we have the seven bits or the eight bits of the address and which tells you if it wants to read or write. So writing is a zero in the end and reading is a one in the end. Here it asks for writing. This plus is an ACK. After the ACK there are again 8 bits, which you see here, which are ACT. And then there is a second start bit, meaning it's another transaction. 
And in this transaction, you actually see again that it selects the slave by using the address A0 and in the end it writes a 1 to read the data. The device acts it, the slave sends the data, the master acknowledges it, the slave sends the data, the master acknowledges it and the master sends a stop condition. And this is one transaction and you can see the same syntax all over the place. Now let's compare the, the three logs which we have. Um, as you can see, there is no difference between, there's not a lot of difference between washing machine one and washing machine, uh, the, the, these two traces. So on the same machine, just one after another. What we can see though, uh, these are different. So if we see that there's not a lot of things which are different, we can say that it doesn't use any kind of encryption because every time it should use an encryption, uh, it should we reuse another, another key, so the traffic should be completely different. And here it's not different. So this is first a good clue. It doesn't use any encryption. The second thing we see is that there are not a lot of things which are different. It does the same things all the time, except here and here. So here we can see that it uses the same address. So it writes at 1C and then when it reads at 1C, it gets the data 0B13. Here we see again that it writes at 1C and here it writes 0C13. So it's one bit more, it's incremented by one on here. And this value, if we replug the card, we find it here again. This is the 0C13. And after it read this value, it will write the next value. So at this address, this is probably the read count. Since it's that simple, I've already figured out that because it doesn't use any um, encryption and because it does all the transaction again, this is probably not a very complicated smart card. There is no smartness inside. It is just plain memory and I2C is quite often used for just reading and writing EEPROM values, small EEPROMs. I didn't know that when I looked at I2C, but this is a classic example where actually the device, the, the EEPROM address is selected here, then you write at which address in the EEPROM you want to read or write data and you either read the data by using the, the second transaction, or you write the data just by writing additionally to it. Um, we can see that there's a difference between these two. So it, it, in the beginning, it reads two values at two different address, B2 and FE. FE it writes actually only. Yeah, it, it only writes at FE. So here it reads at B2 in the beginning, and here it reads at E1. But afterwards, it reads always at the same address, 26 in hex up to um, 32, then 1C. So here you can see the address. I will not read it for you. But it reads always at the same address, and then it writes here. I think this write is to end a transaction because we can see there's one transaction here. It writes at this address. And we have seen, we see the other transaction here with writes after, after the reading. I think, uh, the beginning it reads, uh, special fields to figure out which kind of card it is. Is it just a card which is, has just value on it? So I can, um, so I can add value or add money or subtract money. Or is it one of the maintenance cards which do some other things? Since I don't have a maintenance card, but a normal value card, um, I can only tell about this. Uh, I can only tell the values about the, the credit cards, like value cards. But different machines read at different address to verify what it means. And the data is not too much alike. Um, all the machines read the same address range, which you see here. So this address range probably encodes the value of the card. And in the end, it writes two, it writes two things at once here, actually. It's, 
it writes so here we figured out this is the recounter because it's incremented every time i plug it into a new machine this is the end of the transaction after the end of the transaction it writes the read counter at the static value some sort to reinitialize it reinitialize it after it write at 1c at the read counter it will put the previous value incremented by one as you can see here so the first byte is the least value and we we can see that it's 0d which we find here on the right and then we have 0e so it's again incremented by one after it's been reset to a default value so in the beginning we have the header where it reads what kind of card it is it ends the transaction then here it reads the value of the card it ends the transaction not, not only the value but some other information i don't really know but at least it reads the value from here because the machine displays uh, there is zero points on the card and then it writes the the read counter here we can see after i've loaded the card so previously there was a value of zero or zero euros on the card and I, then I reloaded it at, uh, at their desk. I couldn't sniff how to reload it because obviously there was a human behind it re reloading it and it would be too obvious if I would come with my, um, with my proxy. But I've put two euros. Two euros corresponds to 20 points. And we can see here that the beginning doesn't change when it checks what card or what type of card it is or some kind of header. And afterwards, the data changes. So this data, this is different to, to here. This tells us that the value is probably written at this address because that's almost the only thing which changed, or at least at this address, because we already know that this is the counter which we can see here again. So the counter, the read counter is incremented all the time and the data is changed at this address. I've rechecked my card with 10 euros on another machine and we can see that here only the, the type of card, the header is read to verify what type of card it is. And then the value, which is here, didn't change. Only the read counter changed. So, this is one additional information. Now we know that this value is somehow stored in here. And this is some other data which seems to be static, like this data, it also seems to be static. The next thing I did is decremented the value by just paying the machine because I needed to, to wash something. So we have a beginning value of 10 euros and we have an end value of 8 euros and in the middle we have this decrement of value of this resetting of value here we can see again that the only thing which changes is this block so this is the read count and this is the value block and if you compare this value block to this value block it's the same it stands for 10 euros and if you change this value block if you compare this value block to this value block it's it's different and this one represents um, 8 euros and in the middle uh, here we have one more transaction to decrement the value so it the machine reads the value in the beginning and then it restarts by checking what type of card it is by reading but now it doesn't read the value, it will write the value. So it remember what was the value before, and then it will write the value. It will write it twice. I think just to be sure, probably just to be sure that it's written the right way and to, yeah, to ensure that the transaction happened the, the, the right way. And we can see here because uh, A0 is to write, then you write at this address and this is the value you write. Here it writes the address, but then it reads the data. And we can see that it reads at exactly the same addresses, 28 to 32, as we see here, 28 to 32 in hex. And it does it two times to be sure that uh, the transaction is the right one and the bits are, are set the right way. And then the value, which is here, we can also read it here. We know now it's a plain memory. The value is at this address. We just have to figure out the, the encoding. 
now we know that the values it's is stored within these bytes and i've took three different traces for three different values and we want to figure out how the value is stored so here we have 20 points which correspond to 10 euros 16 points and 12 points and as you can see these values differ this again we don't count because this is just a read count which is incremented all the time if we look at one block you will see something a bit curious the first byte is decremented by four and this continues on decrement by four decrement by four decrement by four and so on the second byte is incremented by four when you increment the address here we see increment by four increment by four increment by four so what is only important is this first value the other values are just increments or decrements of this value I'm not sure if this is some kind of encryption security or if it's just to have redundant data and to check if there is error on the card. But um, you see this pattern. You can see it here again. Here there's a decrement by 4 and here there is an increment by 4 when you increase in the address range. So that's the first point. We know that only this value is important. Um, the other thing is that we've looked at the read counter and in the read counter you see that the first byte is changed when you read it another time. So here we see it's incremented and here we see it's again incremented. This tells us that it's encoded in little endian, meaning that this first byte is the smaller value and the second part is the bigger value which comes in the beginning we see it also we can confirm it by looking at this result here we've decremented by four points the value and we can see that it's gone from e751 to 0f51 the 51 didn't change if we decrement again by four points the 51 didn't change only the first byte changed so probably the first byte encodes uh, the um, so here we see again that this is the the first byte is the smaller value it's encoded in little endian and another thing which is important is here we see that this value is this is the value which is which is changed so this encodes somehow 20 points, this encodes 16 points, this encodes uh, 12 points. So here I've taken several dumps or several traces which I've did. This is for 20 points which are on the card, this is for 0 points and as we found out the value is only stored within here. The following, th uh, the following are just variations of this. So we're only interested at this the value which is stored at 0x28 and I've taken the value we also know it's encoded into little endian so I've taken this value here and these are the several other values for example for 0 we have 51 AF as you can see 51 AF and this corresponds to this decimal 20,911 and so and and so on now if we look at the values the difference between 0 and 10 as you can see here is 100. There is a subtraction of 100 at this address to have a value gain for 10. If we go to 10 from 10 to 12, we have a subtraction of 20 points of 20. And from 12 to 16, again, we have a subtraction of 40. Now, what's funny is if we go to 16, from 16 to 20 because here we don't have a subtraction of 40 as you can see here we have some kind of addition this is because of the encoding we know that 0 starts at 51 AF and then it wraps around we can see there's a subtraction here a subtraction here a subtraction here but if you subtract 40 from 0F you will land to this number E7. 
simply because it uh, one byte only encodes 256 values and you wrap around until you reach AF again since 51 AF is the zero. This is why this decoding is confusing, but if you look at the hex, you see that there is a subtraction of 40. So now we know how the value is encoded within this card. We know it's at this address, we know the following addresses are just variation of the first address, and then there are static blocks which you find almost anywhere. Now that we figured out how the data is encoded uh, on the memory on this card, I wanted to read it out myself. The problem with this reader is that it doesn't provide the ability to write or read data using A to C, at least not on Linux. I know there are Windows drivers to do that, but I don't use Windows and I don't want to develop on the Windows. Um, since I2C is not too complicated, I decided to use a Raspberry Pi to implement it. So here we have the Raspberry Pi and it is connected to the card reader. I connected between ground, the third pin from the top, uh, three volts, and then just behind it there is clock and data, or data and clock, the other way around. And if I put the card inside, I've developed a small program. And if I start it, it will read the data. This is the dump, which we've seen. So this is the address and this is the value at the address. And as we can see, it reads the value 200. So this stands for um, 10 euros, 200, I think, yeah. And it also displays the, the read count. And at least, the, so we know this works quite well. The program can do a little more. It can just increment the read counter. We know it's at address 1C. It can set the credit because we know exactly at which this, it's, the credit is at this address and we figured out the encoding. So we can even um, change how much there is on this credit. Then we can dump the whole card, so the whole I2C memory, if we want to make further analysis for finding out a manufacturer card and so on. And then we can program a card because in the beginning it will verify at defined offsets which you've seen in the beginning, if the values match. So we have some fixed blocks and this is what it does. Uh, and if it doesn't see the fixed blocks at this address, it's probably not one of these cards or the cards has been broken. So we can reprogram the card and rewrite the values at this offsets to tell it, okay, this is now a washing machine card. Um, let's try to set the credits at 400, for example. Setting value to 400. And then if we read it, we see we have a value of 400 again. And we can see the value here. And just to show that it works, I will put a bogus value and we will read it on the machine to see if this is right. Up, 999. This is not normally something which you can set. You can only set uh, the two first digits. And if we show it again, then it should be 999. And we will check on the machine if this really works. So I've proven that it works. Uh, this time, I will not put the source code of this program for the Raspberry Pi online. I don't want... My purpose was not to have a program to charge my card. Washing is pretty inexpensive. And I mean, there is water, there's electricity, there's maintenance and so on. My, so I will not provide it so you can set the value yourself. The encoding is pretty simple. The idea was here to find out how it works. So in case the, the manufacturer disappears, so Vatromat, Vatroma, in case the manufacturer disappears or stops supporting these machines or for any kind of other reason the product is not here anymore, we now know how the protocol works and we can still maintain a thing. So it's just for inter interoperability and not for faking the values. That's an important part. Here we are again in the washing machine room and this is the machine where you have to pay and which controls the machine itself. This is the normal card and if we put it inside we see it's depleted completely. It has a value of zero. 
Now, this is the modified card where I put a value of 99.9 .9 or 999, which shouldn't be possible because there shouldn't be any decimal after the point. And if you put inside, we see 999. So we know it, it pretty much works. Now that we've tested the implementation and that we know it works, at least the program which I wrote on the Raspberry Pi, I wanted to re-implement it into an easier way. Not everyone has a Raspberry Pi, uh, and then buying such hardware just for writing cards is a bit expensive because I2C is pretty simple. And also it's a bit of a pain because you have to SSH to it again, uh, you have to, to, to launch the, the program and so on. So I've decided to re-implement re it into something smaller. Um, into this. As we can see, this is pretty simple. We just have a smart card slot where I can plug in the card and on the back I have an Arduino Nano. Arduinos also provide hardware I2C. Um, they call it TVI two-wire interface instead of inter-integrated circuits, but it's the same thing. They document it just a bit differently, probably because of I2C is a trademark or they didn't want to pay license. I don't really know. But the two wire interface proposed here is compatible with the I2C and works pretty well. So this is the two pins which you see here. There is one is clock, one is data. And then here we have ground. Here I provide five volts and here I read if the card is inserted or not because this card slot has a switch to know if the card is inside or not. And if the card is inside, then um, I can start this TVI protocol to, to talk to the card. So this is a pretty simple device. And if you, you just have to provide power here, you can either just provide power or you can all even read over serial what, what the value is and set the values and uh, program the cards. Again, this shows you that even if the machines which are used on the washing machines um, don't exist anymore because they're not supported, because the manufacturer just died, the, just, the manufacturer just uh, stops producing them or because they don't support them anymore, you can really implement it yourself with something really basic. So here is the Arduino Nano because um, it's a throwaway board which I use. Again, I will not provide the source code which I implemented on this device simply because I, um, it would only be used to change the value and um, the idea was to show that you can to make it into a purple. So if something this uh, happens, you can still implement it yourself. Now we found out how to read write the values so in case the manufacturer disappears we can still implement the program. But if the manufacturer disappears or stop, stop supporting the product they will probably not support this card even more. You cannot buy it and then you sit on a whole stack of cards which in the end will die because the chip here is uh, will age and will stop working at some point. So that's a problem. Now we know the protocol and we know this is simply memory, which you can talk over using the I2C protocol, I2C. And memory over the I2C is pretty common in the microcontroller industry. Actually, you use um, I2C EEPROM. Like on this board, here on the left, you see there is an Atmel chip, but this is simply I2C EEPROM, so some kind of data, and you recognize it with the part number 24C32. 24C is somehow the class telling this is I2C EEPROM, and 32 tells you how many kilobits you have. I think 32 stands for 32 kilobits, if I'm not wrong. And here we uh, only 256 bytes are important. So you could use an 24C01 or 24C02 EEPROM. The problem is that they come in this SOC package or DIP package. They rarely come into a uh, smart card format. But if you look around, and I will provide the link, you can find these cards. You just look for 24C02 because it's small. It's almost as small as you can find and it's big enough to contain the data. And then you find blank 
white PVC cards. You can have it pre-printed also if you pay a little more, but what you could also do is just print them yourself. And this is what we did here. So I've contacted the people which um, handle the, the washing machines to tell them, well, it's possible to, to make your own card in case this manufacturer dies. Also, they had a problem because um, they hadn't had any, they didn't have any cards anymore for three months. It took them three months to deliver the order. I don't know why exactly, but it took them three months. So in between, I've just ordered some cards like this and I flashed them myself so they could use it. And as you can see, it's pretty professional. Um, the writing which we did on it is not that hard. We use some kind of wa wax, uh, wax paper. So this paper, is, is glowing and this sheet is has some kind of wax. So you print using a laser printer with toner on the paper. And toners are just plastic balls, which are put on the paper. And the plastic balls will be on this greasy wax paper. You print the two sides. And afterwards you put the cards and you put everything in a laminator like this one. Exactly as you would do with toner transfer if you want to produce PCB. So you transfer the toner from this paper using heat because there's a just melt and plastic pork on the plastic card itself. And if you do it for, if you do it for four times, so this is the hot laminator, you will find this, this card. It's not perfect. It still goes away, but I mean, for an amateur um, alternative, it's, it's not bad. And I'll show you that these cards with uh, the normal EPROM memory, which we found also work on, on the machines. This is a small reader implemented. It, it, this is the USB battery to power it. And if we put the card which had zero in the beginning inside here, the second red LED is on, meaning uh, that it's been successful. And if I put it again in the machine, we see, oh, there's an error. We see there is a value of 20. So you see there is an error. So this machine will not last for long, probably. <laughs> so here we, so we, there is a value of 20. So we've been able to, to write the, to rewrite the value of it. And in the end, we have this card, custom made card which is pretty nice and we will test if it's really compatible. So if we put it inside, we see we also have a value of 20. Mm -hmm. So it works perfectly and actually you could pay with it and it would work. I mean, it detected the value of 20. And with that, that's the project. We know how this, this card works. We've implemented, re-implemented the protocol. We, uh, we could build machines which um, puts money on it or removes money, so the charging machine or the machine which controls the, um, the washing machine where you have to pay. Uh, we could, we can even create our own cards, but we should only do that if the uh, manufacturer doesn't support this product anymore and if we still have a stack of cards or a stack of machines which are controlled by these pay machines. Enjoy!